Good evening, Mariner students. Excited to be with you guys this week. Uh, I, I wanted to a message from where I would be doing it live in person with the other students. So I'm just I'm outside uh, in the back, just so you guys know where I am and you can kind of visualize that. This is just the the wall behind me, um, and uh, just wanted to welcome you. I'm so glad that you're tuning in and excited to, to just be a part of what you guys are growing and how you're growing and how you're getting your summer started. Uh, why don't we start with a word of prayer and we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father God, just want to thank you for allowing us to meet this evening. Uh, Lord, I thank you for those that um, that are, are here in person, but Lord, also I want to thank you for those that are at home and are uh, investing in their spiritual walk with you by taking part of this lesson, Lord. I pray that this would allow them to grow even closer to you. And uh, we'll make sure to give you the praise and the glory for everything that's said and done uh, this evening. We love you so much. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so we are going to be uh, finishing this series, our origin series. And uh, this is week four, and, and just talking about how God has shaped you and molded you to be used for His glory. And uh, so just talking about heroes, and we often don't think about ourselves as a hero, um, but we're seeing how these different things play out as far as uh, the week one, we looked at heroes embrace who God made them to be, you know, we, and, and we talked about how, uh, she really didn't discover her power until she couldn't figure out who she was until she discovered the power available to her. But then part of that also included what her mission was. She needed to discover her mission. Then the second week we looked at that heroes care for the people in front of them and just being aware of of the needs that are around us and then last week we looked at that heroes are stronger when they're on a team and this week we're going to look at we're going to kind of wrap it up with heroes are heroic in ordinary moments and uh you know so we've talked about these different superheroes along the way and uh last week we we looked at um Wonder Woman and her origin story and uh, and this week I want you to kind of think about a scenario if you've ever seen the Thor movies the third one is Ragnarok and this is of all of the Marvel movies it's probably the most creative of all of the Marvel movies and uh, you have some iconic scenes between Thor and Hulk and uh, I'm not specifically going to reference the fight scene, although that is pretty awesome. What I'm talking about is later on, they're, they're having this moment where they're just in the room together and they, they start having an argument. They, they don't fight, but they have an argument with each other. And it, it, it really kind of shows how they uh, hurt each other. They hurt each other's feelings then they walked through how to reconcile it and kind of gave a good example in the movie there and uh and, and sometimes you know in the instance of this one it was kind of a a laugh that got them through it and and maybe there's been times when you were arguing with a friend or a family member and it was getting heated and heated and heated and then all of a sudden one of you said something that was so ridiculous that both of you had to stop and laugh at the situation. I can't believe we're yelling at each other for this. And that's what got you to, to the point of reconciliation. Like, what are we doing? This is crazy. Uh, and, and then there's other times where you were arguing with a friend and just a laugh wouldn't cut it. A laugh wouldn't do it. A joke wouldn't do it. There came a point where you needed to apologize to a friend. You know, when we think about heroes, we often think about saving the world in big ways and uh, de like defeating aliens or preventing villains from destroying a city. But in real life, being a hero is more about what you do in those ordinary moments. 
And so, uh, you know, heroes, they're courageous, they're strong, they're compassionate, they're driven to make wrong things right in the world. Sometimes the best way to do that is by owning our mistakes and reconciling with someone we've hurt, even if we didn't mean to hurt them, but you did hurt them. So uh, being heroic is finding ways to reconcile that. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about where God or one of God's people tells us how to handle things uh, when we're hurt or uh, when we've hurt someone. Uh, and I want to read one of them to you. It's found in James chapter 5, verse 16, and it says this, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and wonderful results. You know, so, you know, this idea of reconciliation starts with, you know, ad admitting. That word confess is another word for admitting. And, and so what we see from this verse is reconciling with someone we've hurt is really hard work. But it is the key to healing. You know, that, that scene that I had mentioned with Thor and Hulk, you know, in their, in their argument, if you were to go back and, and, and kind of look at the model that they showed, you, we saw that Thor, he apologized and he corrected the hurtful thing that he said. Then Hulk accepted his apology. Then Thor shared the hurtful thing that Hulk had done to him. And Hulk apologized and shared how he felt, and they found common ground. And, and that's what happens when we're able to have a conversation about these things. Uh, I, what I said was wrong. What I did was wrong. I'm sorry. That wasn't my intention. I hope that you can see that. But I do understand how that was hurtful to you. And, uh, and we're going to look at kind of a template of how that can play out. How does this scenario of, of reconciling play out? But before we do, look in Luke chapter 10. And, you know, we could share a lot more passages of how, how we should apologize, how we should forgive, how we should reconcile. Uh, instead, we want to share a bigger principle about how we're called to treat each other. And, and we're going to think about who do we need to reconcile with and how this passage can relate to that person. So as I'm turning there, think about is there someone that you need to reconcile with, that you have an unresolved conflict with, and how this can relate to that. So Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 29 says this. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So in this passage, we see that this man, he, he was trying to, uh, he, was a, he was someone that studied the Old Testament. He said he was a lawyer, but when we think of uh, he was an expert in the law. When we think of an expert in the law, nowadays we think of a lawyer in court. Back then, they were talking about the law of God. He was an expert in the Old Testament, is what that meant. So when Jesus, he knew this when, when the man asked him that question. And so that's why Jesus responded by saying, you tell me, what does the law say? So number one, Jesus flips the question over and says, that the way to please God is simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. But, number two, loving your neighbor is not simple and it's not easy. 
and uh, and and we're gonna we're gonna see um, how this relates. You know, loving the people around us is not always easy. In fact, e and, and maybe you're thinking about your worst enemy, but maybe even if it's the people living in your own household, sometimes it's hard to love the people even in your own household. And you know what? I bet they would say the same thing. Maybe sometimes you are hard to love. And that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow. That's a hard thing to, to accept and understand. Uh, but let's look at this a little further. Um, because this man was an expert in Jewish law, in the Old Testament, Jesus refers to, he actually quoted something from the Old Testament to him. And the man, to his credit, he quoted it back very well. Uh, and even, um, I think that man maybe had been following Jesus around because Jesus had spoken. He had recited this specific passage before. And so because of this, Jesus knew that he understood this reference to, um, uh, it was in uh, an ancient prayer of God's people. And this prayer is often repeated throughout the Old Testament, uh, which is, and it literally the word for this prayer means listen and is the first commandment. That's the first command in this prayer is what we're going to read. So um, the second command is love. And so let's listen to, let's see what it says. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Literally that word hear is translated listen. So we see the first, um, uh, number one, in order to love God, we must first listen to God. He starts out by saying, hear everyone, listen to this. Love God. And then number two, maybe by listening to and loving God, we can learn to listen to and love others as well. You know, Jesus, he said, this is the biggest thing that you can get on, if you hear anything else from me, love God and love the people around you. If you two things, you won't even have to worry about any of the rest of the Old Testament law because you'll be fulfilling it. And he's, another way of saying that, uh, the Bible literally says the, the law and testaments rest on these two commands. So if you look at all of the Ten Commandments, they have everything to do with one of these two, either loving God or loving people. You start focusing your life on those two things, and he says, you'll, you'll be getting it right. So back to this story in Luke chapter 10, you know, this, this lawyer wasn't totally satisfied with Jesus's answer to love God and to love his neighbor. You know, he said, well, who then, who is my neighbor? So back in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gave a story about this. So the man finished by saying, and who is my neighbor? Why did he ask that? He asked that because he was wanting to justify his unloving actions. So Jesus shared this story with him. Jesus replied with an illustration. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and money, beat him up, and him. by chance a Jewish priest came along. But when the man saw the man, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt deep pity. Kneeling beside him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with medicine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two pieces of silver and told him to take care of the man. 
If his bill runs higher than that, he said, I'll pay the difference the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So we have this scenario. There's no doubt the Samaritan man is the hero of this story. He noticed a need, he showed compassion, and he saved this man's life. Number two, but the Samaritan man didn't set out to be a hero. He simply saw a need and met it. Other people saw the same need but passed by. The Samaritan man saw and then loved. He was heroic in an ordinary moment. Just take, take a second to think about this story that Jesus illustrates. He could have used any people group around, but he chose to make the hero someone that was despised in his own culture. In the Jewish culture, they looked down in their society on the Samaritans because they were half Samaritan, uh, they were half Jewish, half Gentile. And so they were looked at as not, not on the same level as them. Does that sound familiar? Can you think of any scenarios in our own culture where that could be happening? Picture that, I mean, that's a, that's a very real scenario for right now in today's, uh, today's time. And this says that this man was traveling along, a Jewish man traveling along, and it says uh, a temple assistant. So maybe like uh, someone like me, an assistant pastor, an associate pastor approaches and sees him, sees that he's hurt, and decides to cross the street and continue on his journey. He has more important things to do. Then it says, um, let me see who was the next person. Um, well, that was the second person. The first person was the actual priest. So, so a, a pastor comes by and he sees this man. And what does he do? He crosses over. He has more important things to do. He passes. He ignores the need of of the of the person in front of him that is despised by the person that's hurt he walks by and says there's a need and I'm here and God has blessed me enough to fulfill that need and so he shows compassion he shows love he he holds the man he he helps him up he brings him to get medical care he pays the bill for that medical care and to even stay where he is he says, I have to continue on to a meeting, but I'm, when I come back, I'm going to check on him. And if there's a further bill, I'm going to pay for that too. This is the man that's despised in their culture. And Jesus said, be like those people. And I think Jesus did that for a very real purpose. He could have chosen a Jewish person to illustrate that, but I think they wouldn't have necessarily got the message that Jesus was trying to illustrate here. Jesus was saying that we are to show everyone love. Their background is, no matter uh, what they've done or what they look like. Same kind of love. Why? Because Jesus showed everyone the same kind of love. So what do we learn? Um, now we move on to what do we what do we do with this? Uh, you know, just just like the Samaritan man was was saw wrong and made it right. Jesus Jesus modeled that for us. Jesus's own ministry is filled with seeing something wrong and making it right. Uh, in John chapter five, Jesus saw a man who had been paralyzed since birth. He righted that wrong by healing him. In Matthew 4, he saw two men who hadn't yet heard the, of the good news of Jesus that Jesus was offering. He wronged that right by inviting them into a more purposeful life with him. In Matthew chapter 9, he saw a crowd of people uh, who needed hope and healing. And Jesus righted that wrong by healing, by teaching, and encouraging his disciples to do the same. Heroes are known for righting wrongs, but sometimes the hardest wrongs to right are the ones that we've created. 
You know, everyone wants to be a hero in situations where they get to do something big and flashy. Everyone notices, everyone applauds. They get all the glory and none of the blame. But the real heroes, they know the most heroic things happen when you right a wrong, no matter how small, when hardly anyone notices but you and God. You take responsibility and you work to right your own wrongs. I want you to picture, here's a, here's a picture of a fence. So who is your neighbor? For starters, your neighbor is the person you can't stand. It's the person who can't stand you. Your neighbor is the person you're fighting with right now. The, your neighbor is the person you haven't talked to in a while because they're still angry or hurt because of what you did or said. When we fight with our neighbors, it's easy to start putting up fences between them and us, like bitterness and uh, anger and silence and guilt and fear and revenge. But you know what? Number one, the more time passes, the bigger the fence between us becomes. The bigger the fence becomes, the more difficult it is to see each other. And thanks to Jesus's example, we know how important it is to see each other. And number two, if we can't see each other through all of our distance, anger, and bitterness, we'll struggle to clearly see the wrongs that need to be made right. So what about you? Are there any fences separating you and your neighbor? What are the wrongs that you need to make right in your relationships? Don't think about what others have done to you. Think about the things that you've done that you need to make right. What fences do you need to heroically climb in order to reconcile with someone that you've hurt? So how do we reconcile? How do we do that? Even if you both feel hurt or angry, someone needs to make the first move toward reconciliation. If you want to be heroic, let that be you. You be the one to, to, to make that first move. So how do you reconcile two words? Admit and apologize. Admit, number two, admit how you hurt them, then apologize. Here's some, just some practical things. Number three, don't make it all about you. This isn't about you. This is about them. It's about how you hurt them. Uh, number four, don't defend yourself. Don't try and justify. You know, this man in the story, he, tried, he was trying to justify his poor actions towards others. That's why he asked, who then is my neighbor? Because he wanted to justify treating others badly. And that's why Jesus mentioned the Samaritans, because the Jewish people were treating them badly. And that's why Jesus illustrated, don't treat them badly. Don't treat anyone badly. So don't, don't defend yourself. Number five, don't tell them not to be hurt or angry. You know, one of the worst things you can say after you've hurt someone's feelings is to just say, I'm just kidding. What you're doing in that moment is you're, you're not validating their feelings. You're not you just made them feel. And what you're doing is you're not taking responsibility for the words that you spoke or the actions that you did. For you to say, I'm just kidding, or for you to say, don't be so sensitive. What you're doing is you're, you're demeaning that person. And you're saying that you don't value them and you don't value how they feel. If you hurt someone, even if you didn't intend it to be that way, but the result is that you hurt them, own it. Recognize and, and uh, recognize that, yes, I did hurt you. I want you to know that wasn't my intention, but I do see that I did hurt you. And apologize for it. You know, number six, apologies don't guarantee healing or reconciliation. Your apology might get rejected or the relationship might be beyond repair. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to right the wrongs that you've made. All you can worry about, if you, when, when you realize that you've done something wrong or you've said something wrong, you can only do your part. 
You can ask for forgiveness with a sincere heart and own your part. Then it's between them and the Lord as far as when they actually do forgive you. It can't be about, you can't force that. That, that But that's exactly why we're talking about it. It's not easy, but that's why it's heroic. You know, heroes are heroic in ordinary. Last week in the, the origin story, and, and we've talked about a lot of things. We've looked at that heroes embrace who God made them to be. Heroes care for the people in front of them. Heroes are stronger when they're on a team. And tonight, heroes are heroic in ordinary moments you know most number one most of the time the kind of heroism god calls us to is not flashy or newsworthy but it is life-changing it happens one person at a time one moment at a time one mission at a time when else does it happen number two it happens when we discover who god made us to be and boldly use our unique gifts for the benefit of others Number three, it also happens when we notice the needs of people right in front of us and get creative to meet those needs. Number four, it happens when we work alongside like-minded people who are committed to the same mission that we're committed to. That's what we talked about last week. And then finally, number five, it happens in school hallways or in our living rooms when we commit to restoring and healing relationships that we've broken. So how are you going to join Jesus on his mission to save the world? He has shaped you, he's molded you, he's saved you to be on the same team with him and other fellow believers on this earth to rescue the world, to reconcile the world between God and man. Will you be a part of that mission? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, just want to thank you so much for loving us, being with us tonight. For everyone that's taking part in this series, thank you for what you're continuing to teach us. Lord, I pray that tonight you will have placed on someone's heart, someone's mind, someone that they need to reconcile with. And I pray that they would take a, a step towards that direction. Help them to be the first one to own their part. And help them climb over that fence and reconcile their own relationship. Because you've called us not only to love you, but to love others. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us first. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, we're excited uh, to continue. I hope you had a great 4th of July yesterday. And uh, we will continue our Tuesday night small group time at the church house located at 1867 Ritchie Highway, Annapolis, Maryland, 21409. Uh, 7 o'clock on Tuesdays if you want to meet us there. We'll continue our study there, how we're growing through life's challenges. And if we don't see you there, we'll see you next Sunday. Have a good one.